Hi, I'm Mike Cypress, Equity Analyst covering brokers and asset managers for Morgan Stanley Research. I'm excited to be joined here today by John Gray, President and Chief Operating Officer of Blackstone, a diversified alternative asset manager with nearly $620 billion of client capital under management. John has been with Blackstone for his entire career, almost 30 years, and helped guide the firm through a record fourth quarter in 2020, the single best quarter in the firm's 35-year history. John, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you here today. Mike, it is great to be here. Morgan Stanley has been and continues to be a great partner to our firm. So, John, I wanted to talk with you about investing during disruption. Uh, as the pace of change accelerates, uh, for many investors, it can be hard to get a beat on what's a fad and what the future may hold. So with things changing so rapidly, how do you look at the landscape and see what disruptions will stick? Well, I try to think about it simply, which is um, what trends have emerged that are fundamentally better? That the use case is, wow, getting that good delivered to me within two hours, as opposed to me having to drive 10 miles to a store, wait in line, pick it out, that's better. I think that will stay. On the other hand, um, if you look at cooking at home, which has been on a downward trend probably for 100 years and now has seen this enormous spike upward, that probably is not, now maybe some people have fallen in love with cooking again, but in general, I think we're gonna revert to the way life was uh, for a bunch of different reasons. And so I think separating that sort of wheat from the chaff, what's temporary, what's permanent is really important. What's cyclical, what's secular? Will people get back on planes again? Will they travel again? Those experiences will come back, but I would go back to sort of the basic use case. What feels better? Who feels like the winner? And if that's the case, then I think the trends are likely to continue. Blackstone is unique uh, from many other asset managers in that you take a more thematic approach to investing. How would you say that process has evolved and how does that give you an edge? The danger I think in investing is you tend to focus on should I pay 97, 99, 102 for an asset? And yet when we look back in the fullness of time, that is not really the key decision. We, we say we, when we focus too much on the house as opposed to the neighborhood, we're losing the forest from the trees. The best example of this would be in our real estate business, if you went back a decade ago and bought a shopping center and you did the best deal possible and you bought it 10% cheaper than market. And I went out and I bought a last mile logistics, a warehouse just across the bridge in New Jersey. And I paid 10% more than anybody back then. It wouldn't have mattered, right? The shopping center today, unfortunately, is worth materially less. That last mile logistics asset's probably worth triple what it was back then. And so getting these big themes right, it doesn't mean you can pay any price, but it's really important to sort of fish in the right location. And so what we're trying to do is step back and say, what are those big themes that are out there? We talked about e-commerce, but basically, broadly speaking, everything's moving online. How can I benefit from that? And not necessarily by buying the companies themselves, but maybe things that are one derivative off. Companies that provide supply chains to that, companies that provide compliance. There's all sorts of things in that ecosystem. Similarly, we're seeing massive transition in energy. We're going from a world that was hydrocarbon driven to a green world. We can debate, is it gonna take 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? It's heading in that direction. So how can I be part of wind and water and solar, battery power? How can I be part of charging stations and energy infrastructure? There's lots of opportunity. What are the different parts of that supply chain? And so again, it's taking a top-down approach, saying these are big thematic areas that we like, and then going out there and bottoms up, analyzing opportunities to take advantage of those themes. And John, how is that thematic approach being put to work here in, in 2021? I think as we get out of this pandemic, sometime over the summer, early fall, the pay down of credit card debt, the enormous increase in savings, and the global cabin fever is gonna unleash an enormous amount of spending on automobiles, on homes, on durable goods, and on travel like you've never seen before. And as a result, I think you'll see um, pressure on commodity prices. I think you'll see upward pressure on wages. 
I think people will be talking more about inflation. And I think the long end of the curve could move up materially. So what does that mean? I think you want to invest hotels, um, transportation infrastructure, rail, airports, roads, ports, um, entertainment, uh, places. We own a big water park business. People are going to get out there. And so travel is something that's been a mega trend now for a long time. It's going to revert. It's been interrupted, but not permanently so. What we're trying to do is find, again, something one derivative off. So we believe in e-commerce. We've continued to be big believers in global logistics. That is our number one theme at the firm. We have bought $100 billion worth of warehouses, increasingly at what we call the last mile. That's really an area that we like a lot. We love content, so movies, TV shows, video games, music. We're looking at that area in a bunch of direct ways by investing in folks who make content, um, advertising firms that, that do online video game advertising, and then in the physical world, buying studio space. That's an area. One of the hallmarks of Blackstone is its ability to innovate by extending into new product sets and finding applications for new customers. Can you talk about your process around that? How do you identify and approach these new verticals? So innovation is really built into our DNA. We're constantly talking about how can we serve our customers in new and different ways? How can we deliver great returns to them? And so everything we do starts from that premise. And what it's enabled us to do is say, look, we do private equity in the US, we can do it in Europe, we can do it in Asia. We do uh, secondaries in private equity, we can do it in real estate, we can do it in infrastructure. And so building on those adjacencies has been a powerful tool for innovation. And then there are new areas. I would say life sciences would be another big area, which is we're seeing the intersection of big data, technology, and genomics coming together to do precision medicine, which is the computers are going to tell us how everyone's going to be treated. It's going to require a whole new range of drugs and cocktails of drugs and so forth. And that's going to create enormous demand. And again, what does that mean for us? It means we're investing in life science companies that develop, uh, are developing phase three trial drugs, but we're also investing in companies that do cold storage and bring these therapies to patients. We're investing in companies in private equity that are commercializing these drugs. And in real estate, we become one of the biggest owners in the world of life science office buildings. So big thematic investing has helped us. I would just add that it's not always technology. Some of the themes are aging populations. You can play that around the world. In Japan, we've done a bunch around pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter drugs. You can see what's happening in India and China in rising middle classes and what that means in servicing them by investing in education and consumer finance. Similarly, in infrastructure, insurance, we see a bunch of areas where we can continue to innovate and expand. Can you talk about how you're innovating with new strategies such as B-Read and Core Plus to meet these challenges? So our, our clients really were the ones who got us into this perpetual capital in real estate. We have always been in the real estate private equity business going back now almost 30 years. And they came to us really, it's probably six or seven years ago and said, hey, you know, we love what you do here, what we call buy it, fix it, sell it. Uh, but could you buy more stabilized real estate, more yield oriented, longer term hold period? We have even more capital for that line of business. And we started going into it. We started in the US with some separate accounts. Then we created an open-ended U.S. fund, then a fund in Europe, then in Asia, now one in life sciences. And that institutional business is now close to $50 billion. And then separately, the same thought came to us really in the retail world. Historically, private REITs um, had gotten a bad name. Customers were charged a lot. The investors deploying the capital didn't have much experience, and the outcomes were bad. And we said, what if we brought sort of the Blackstone quality, our experience in real estate, our ability to add value to assets, um, where we focus the key sectors, 
and charged basically what we do institutional clients and did this again in a more yield-oriented, open-ended vehicle. That led to the creation of Blackstone Real Estate Income Trust, which today has grown to more than $20 billion itself. And so I see it in a low-rate environment, more capital continuing to migrate to these areas. And it's not just in real estate. We're doing it today in private credit as well. So we see it as a real win-win and a place where we can grow quite a bit. So there's a lot of excitement in the markets today, some making comparisons to the late 90s. Can you compare what we're seeing in the markets today to your experience then? And, and what lessons did you learn that you're applying in today's environment? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. In terms of lessons, um, I, I remember buying uh, some warehouses, actually, and office buildings in Silicon Valley uh, at prices in 1999 that made no sense relative to the physical value. And we got caught up. I was young, and I remember we bought a company, a, a building. The tenant was gobosh.com, go big or stay home.com, and I should have stayed home. And, and, you know, sort of the traditional metrics had been thrown out the window. What was interesting back then is the market was right that the internet was going to change the world, but the valuations became unglued from the company's value, from the company values. And we're seeing a bit of that today. I think the areas where that's obviously most pronounced are companies that don't produce positive cash flow and are trading on very high multiples of revenues because the risk is high. Some of them will turn out to be great. Many of them may not. And so I do think you want to be a bit cautious when businesses are no longer valued on traditional metrics. They're valued sort of on momentum. I, I think it is a, a fraught time. I think the support from the market continues from these very accommodated policies, more stimulus coming and the reopening. And, and you're trying to balance that against very high prices and the risk that the long end of the curve moves up. I would just be, I'd say in public markets, a little more cautious on those, the most speculative companies out there. So John, you've never worked anywhere else besides Blackstone. How has that formed your view on culture within Blackstone? I benefited from an environment that's been a real meritocracy. I, I benefited from an environment that has really constantly strived for excellence, constantly pushed for growth and innovation, and been a place where people have been nice to each other and want to work together. I think that's really important in an organization. And so when I got to this seat three plus years ago, my goal was how can I do the same thing? How do I make sure the environment here is as open for as many people, creates as much opportunity? On the hiring front, we have the widest funnel possible, so we're drawing from the broadest community, as diverse talent as possible. When they come in the door, there's a real sense of meritocracy that we don't, as we grow, become a place that's bureaucratic, where it's based on your time served. No, the most talented people can move up and that we're growing as a firm because when we grow, new people can go to run different divisions and have new experiences. And ultimately, I also think it's important to have some fun along the way. So we do our holiday videos and our photo contests and all this because it's a human place and we spend a lot of time here. So creating an environment where people want to work, where they're proud to work, where they want to win, that's a really special place. That's what we're trying to do. Blackstone is such an iconic brand within asset management. How do you view your role as a steward of its transformation here in 2021? It, it, it speaks to sort of who we are, that our job is to manage capital, deliver strong returns, operate with high integrity. That's sort of the essence of who we are. And everything we do has to be sort of in furtherance of that mission. So we can't say things and act a different way. And what that means is at times there are businesses we can't go into, there are people we can't partner with. We do have to pass up some opportunities. We're really focused on how we can deliver what we've promised. And, and I think if we do that and we take a long-term approach to everything we do, then we'll, it'll pay great benefits. And it's not just the investment returns. It's how we communicate, how we report, how we do compliance. It's just, I want everything to be the absolute best. 
And so if we do that, then we'll burnish the reputation, the brand will be stronger, people will have more confidence, the virtuous cycle will continue. John, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Mike, thanks so much for having me.